dreams turn to sorrow, but I can trust the hope for God.
Hello. Good morning. Do you guys want to stand and pray and then we'll get started? Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this time and this place that we can uh, just come together and worship you and have fellowship. Um, ask that you would uh, just fill us with your Holy Spirit in this time and just uh, prepare our hearts um, to receive from the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
for this time that we can just praise you and worship you and just, yeah, just um, enjoy the blessings that you have for us and just the blessing that worship is. Um, but yeah, I ask again that you would just bring your Holy Spirit here and just fill our hearts so that way um, we would have ears to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys want to turn and say hello to each other? Good morning, family. Man, isn't, man, Lord give us a great day, amen? It's going to be like 90s in the next three days or something like that, so it's going to be like Phoenix. There you go. Well, welcome to Calvary Castle Rock. Super blessed that you guys are here. Uh, hey, turn around and say hi to our brothers and sisters that are joining us through awesome technology. Love you guys. If you can be here, we want you to be here. If you have a need, call the church. Amen? couple quick announcements and reminders. So Wednesday, barbecue and baptism. Yeah. Oh. So man, we got like 40 people signed up for that. This is going to be really, really cool. Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. So uh, this Wednesday, we're going to be out back here about 530. So we're going to get together kind of like a potluck theme, grow some hamburgers and hot dogs, and uh, we'll provide some sides. If you guys bring a side dish or a dessert, that would be awesome. Uh, but we want you to get signed up to be baptized because we're going to provide you a certificate. Remember, this is a celebration thing. Baptism doesn't save us. It's an outward declaration of what the Lord is doing internally that you want to proclaim. And so one of the byproducts of baptism is that you come up in newness of life. So we want you to sign up for that as well is because we just want to gauge how long we need to hold you guys down for. It's like two minutes right now, but that could shrink. And so... We just want to kind of get a gauge on that. But seriously, bring uh, a change of clothes if you plan on getting baptized, a towel. We have some extras if you forget about it, but don't worry about it. But man, this is a cool thing. This is a celebration thing. So we want to encourage you guys also, if you're not getting baptized, come out and support those that are, are getting baptized. So this Wednesday, 530 at the church. And then church in the park. Anybody excited about starting up, kicking out church in the park? <laughs> So we're going to meet at, hey, Joey, Church in the Park, what's that about? So Rylight Park, it's over there, and we'll give you directions. We'll have directions at the Welcome Center for you, but we get together, same thing. It'll be uh, the following week, and we're going to start that um, June 23rd, so it'll be at Rylight Park, pot potluck theme, hamburgers, hot dogs, you guys bring a side dish or dessert. We'll eat about 5.30 together. We'll have a time of worship and about a 20, 30-minute uh, Devo, just and it's so cool. There's tons of things to do for the kids to do. There's like basketball. The youth play like volleyball. So Larry's out there smashing balls, you know, like he's an Olympic champion and stuff like that. So just even come for that. But um, just a cool time to be in the park. And there's people that play like uh, there's kids sports going on. So it's really a good light and a witness to our community. So we encourage you guys to come out for that as well. Last announcement that I have, I want to just encourage you guys to pray about opening up your home for community groups. How many of you guys have heard of the Great Commission before, right? Okay. How many of you guys have heard of the Care Commission, the Great Care Commission? So that's in John chapter 21, where God has called us literally to care for one another. And a big way that that happens at Castle Rock, Calvary Castle Rock, not the only way, 
But a huge way that happens is through our community groups. And what community groups do is they meet twice a month, probably for a couple hours. They happen different nights of the week, depending on what works for the host and the facilitator. But it's where we get together and we talk about, okay, hey, we, uh, Pastor Dave taught us this or whoever was teaching that weekend. How do we apply it? How did that text speak to you? Where, where the rubber meets the road for us as believers is not just being a hearer of God's word, but being a doer. And it's also where we get to know people. So, it, I mean, I could sit up here and talk to you guys for great lengths of time about the fruit that happens in the community group, about how people love one another. And there's a medical emergency that happens, and the community group just swarms on that need. So we have about 15 groups that meet right now. The bad news is that eight of them are completely full. They don't have any more space for them. And some of our other groups are getting closer to that. So these things are bearing fruit. We just need more of them. And so what that looks like is you open it up your home twice a month. And what we need is like host homes, somebody to open them. We have people that can come lead those discussions. We just need people to open up their homes. And what we do, we set it up in such a way where it's not burdensome, where we spread the load out. So if there's 10 people coming to your community group, we'll delegate some things. So it's not just, oh, the host home, they take care of everything and clean up and all that type of stuff. So we want to kind of spread the, the responsibility out with that. So if the Lord is tugging on your heart to open up that, come talk to John, Pastor John, or myself. We oversee the community groups and just pray for them. We would love, we have uh, 15 groups right now. We would love to have 30 groups by the end of the year just because God is growing our church. And that is one of the huge ways that we take care of one another. So be in prayer about that. Amen? Well, let's get in the word. Please welcome Pastor Dave. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Calvary Castle Rock. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We have people that would love to put a Bible in your hand so you can follow along with us. We are in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I love it when I get uh, emails or people text me and say, hey, Dave, this is something else I saw in God's Word, or this is uh, something I was reading told me this, and then they they hand it off to me. And uh, this last week, um, I had somebody who gave me this, and uh, when it came to Adam and Eve and covering themselves in fig leaves. And so, He uh, emailed me and he said this. He said, Dave, the very first physical pain that Adam and Eve may have felt could have been caused by the very first thing they did when they discovered their nakedness. The fig trees produce a sap which has chemical properties that can cause extreme rashes and blisters and other skin problems. Now remember what they were covering It is highly possible when they made themselves coverings of fig leaves, the sap from those leaves would have gotten into their bodies to cause anything from irritations to burn-like symptoms. This is a good analogy of how when we try to cover our sins, it often causes more pain in the process. I love that. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. So I didn't come up with that, but that, you know, it's, uh, and I love that when you guys send me stuff like that because it's like, wow, I never thought of that and didn't know that. And, uh, and yet the analogy is amazing. When we do try and cover our sins, it's going to bring more pain in the process. Not a good thing. Um, so at this point in our study, Adam and Eve have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has questioned them. Uh, They have admitted that they have eaten of the tree. Uh, And so we see Adam blame God, then Eve, and then we see Eve kind of blame the serpent at that point. And so at this part, God is now going to pronounce judgments. And he pronounces judgments in the order in which the sin kind of happened. And so first it's going to be with the serpent and Satan and then uh, Eve and then Adam. And so we read here in verse 14... It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. The reason the serpent is judged is because the serpent allowed itself to be used by Satan. And normally animals aren't morally responsible for their actions, but if an animal causes harm to a man, then that animal must suffer the consequences. We see that throughout Scripture in Genesis 9, 5 and Exodus 21, verse 8, 
right after the flood, one of the first things God said to uh, Noah is in verse 5. It says, surely for your life blood, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it and from the hand of man. We know in the Mosaic covenant, we read in Exodus 21, 28, if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh not eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. And so here at the beginning of creation, things are no different. Animals were created to benefit man. And instead, if you harm mankind, then you are going to be judged. And that's what happens here with the serpent. And so the curse goes on here in chapter 3, verse 14. It says, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And so we find out that the serpent is more cursed than all of them. The, the serpent actually goes through some sort of DNA change because he says, on your belly you shall go. And so at this point, the serpent obviously was upright. And now from this time on, they're going to go to its belly and it's going to have to crawl on its belly. And so it shows that before the fall, again, the snake was upright. And now um, the judgment caused its DNA to change and whatever limbs it had and however he moved about, those are now gone. And so it goes on, it says, and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. Now, to eat dust implies humiliation. We see this in Micah 7, 17, Isaiah 49, 23. We see it in Psalm 72, verse 9. In all these instances, for someone to lick dust or to eat dust always speaks of a vanquished foe bowing before its conqueror, bowing and licking the dust of the feet of the conquering king. And the interesting thing to me is, is that to eat dust is actually very accurate for a snake. In the roof of a snake's mouth, there's an organ called the vomeronasal organ or the VNO or Jacobson's organ. And like the sense of smell, this is a system designed to to detect many different chemicals on the ground left behind by prey, which requires physical contact. The snake achieves this with its forked tongue, constantly flickering to pick up the dust on its forked tongue, and then carrying that sample of that dust with the special chemicals left behind by its prey to its special organ inside the roof of its mouth to be able to detect and follow that prey. So the snake literally and actually really does eat dust, just like God's word says. And so now after cursing the serpent, God now deals with the real culprit behind the serpent and what the serpent did, Satan. And in verse 15 of chapter 3, it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. And so we see this here. There's a special animosity that's going to happen between Satan and womankind that God himself places there. Why? Because it is going to be the redemptive role of the woman that is going to bring about the Messiah who is going to destroy Satan. And because God has given this to the woman, this special honor to the woman, of course, that's going to call, cause animosity, enmity between Satan and his seed and the woman and her seed, as we'll see here in a moment. And so again, we see, and between your seed and her seed, again, this seed from the woman, we know from biology that women don't have seed. Men have seed. And so if this is the woman's seed, then it's not going to come from a man. And we know it comes from God. And so when we go through God's word, we see that genealogies are always traced through the male line. Not so when it comes to the Messiah and his lineage. It's going to be different. Moses does not tell us why this will be true, as he wrote the account here to Genesis. Nor does he tell us why the Messiah will be of the seed of the woman. But we can infer, because we know biology, it speaks of the virgin birth. We're not told that specifically until many centuries later with Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 7, 14 tells us that the Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. And then this is confirmed in Luke's account and Matthew's gospel account. The angel Gabriel tries to explain to Mary how she is going to conceive. And so we read in Luke 1.35, it says, And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now, Joseph, her betrothed, isn't quite buying from Mary of how she conceived. And so because of that, Gabriel the angel visits him in a dream. And so we read in Matthew 1, verse 20, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so this is scripture, interpreting scripture. And so we know this seed that we see all the way back here. We know that that seed is speaking of the virgin birth. Now, something interesting here when this word seed is mentioned, we read here, uh, it's mentioned two times. It says between your seed, meaning the woman, uh, I'm sorry, meaning Satan, and then her seed. And so Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says the term seed is used twice in the same verse. So it should be understood in the same way. The implication is if there is a supernatural conception for the seed of the woman, then there's going to be a supernatural conception for the seed of the Antichrist. And so, um, which I thought was very interesting and it, and it makes you think about some things. So because the Antichrist doesn't always know, okay, um, the second coming of Christ, doesn't know when the rapture is going to take place, doesn't know a bunch of different things, doesn't know up until that point exactly when that Messiah is going to be born. He always has to have someone ready to fulfill that role as the Antichrist. And so he would go on, and many theologians would say this, that, that Satan always has an Antichrist for every generation, just waiting to be infilled by him to be used in the way that he needs to be used there in the last days because he doesn't know when the last days are. Um, and so uh, very fascinating. Is, is it any wonder that we see all these death spots along the way? And uh, we'll mention a few here in a moment, and I'll get back to that. So he goes on and he says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, we know according to God's word that, and, and just in uh, everyday life, when it comes to a snake, when you hit a snake on the head or you step on the snake on the head, you can crush it and kill it. But the biting of the heel isn't necessarily a death blow. It is a wounding. And so we see here that the seed of the woman, the Messiah, is going to bruise Satan's head that speaks of destruction, a death blow. And you, however, are going to be able to bruise the Messiah's heel. So we know this when we go through God's word and the history of what God did in sending his son dying on the cross for the sin of mankind, that Satan really thought that he was going to kill Jesus at that point. And he dies and goes in the tomb, but death couldn't hold him because he was a perfect sacrifice. And he rose three days later in his body, okay? It's a bodily resurrection. And so his wounding was only temporary. It did not promote permanent death. And so this has come to pass. And that actually was a bruising of the head of Satan that will be completed at the end of days when Satan is taken and put into the lake of fire. And so we saw that happen there by his death and resurrection in Hebrews 2, 14 and 18 tells us that. And you shall bruise his heel. Again, that biting is just a wounding. This is known in scripture, this area of scripture in Genesis 3.15 as proto-evangelium. It's a Latin word that means the first gospel. Here we see the first messianic prophecy of the first coming of Jesus, the Messiah, which is absolutely amazing because what it tells us is that this isn't plan B for God, okay? This did not catch God off guard, Adam and Eve sinning. God has foreknowledge. Before the foundation of the world, he knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. 
And so God had a plan in place from the very beginning. He was going to send his son to die for the sin of mankind. And so when sin happened, the very moment that it happened, God had a plan that he's always had to bring redemption to mankind, to bring them back to God. And we see it here in verse 15. And that shows us in the midst of judgment, God gives grace and mercy and he foretells of a coming Messiah who's going to redeem mankind once and for all. And it's going to be his son. And we see it. And it's going to be of a virgin birth. Because of this, Satan is also there. He hears about this. He knows about this. He, he has just heard, heard the judgment, the prophecy that's going to be given through the woman that, is, that, that someone is going to be born that is going to crush and destroy you. Okay, so if that's in the future, then every time... Uh, we see this at the very beginning in chapter 4. What happens? We have um, Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel. And what does Satan do? He convinces Cain to do what? Kill Abel. All right? Wants to kill the line of the woman. So what? So the Messiah can't come. And we see this time and time again with the famines in Genesis, the edict of Pharaoh to destroy all male children in the book of Exodus, the Egyptian attack of the Red Sea to kill all the, uh, the, the Jews, the plot of Haman to kill the Jews in the book of Esther. And then we see Herod's edict to put to death all the male children under the age of two in Matthew's account once he finds out that the Christ child has been born. And so again, always trying to eradicate the line that this Messiah is to come from. Now the Messiah has come. Now what? Now what does Satan do? Well, I want you to go to Matthew 23. Go to Matthew 23. It's very important that you see this. It'll give you a greater understanding of what we're seeing in the world today. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Five days later, after coming in Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified. But it says here, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus holds them responsible for not being willing to receive him. Okay, which means they have what? Free will. Okay, mankind has free will. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall, say, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is a Hallel Psalm that is in Psalm 118. And that is to be sung and spoken to the Messiah. Okay, to the Messiah. He says, unless you say that to me, I'm not coming back. So what has to happen? The Jews as a nation have to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. In Zechariah, we're told that as a nation, they will look upon him, the Jewish nation, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. They pierced Jesus. So they will come to a place where they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. When they do that, collectively as a nation, that's when Jesus comes back at the second coming and the end of the tribulation period. But Jesus makes it very, I'm not coming back. Unless you say that. Satan knows this. So what do you think he does from the moment that Jesus crucified and then risen from the dead? That didn't work. I wasn't able to contain him. But ah, I remember he said this. So what I will do is I will try and persecute the Jews and try and kill them through all these generations so there is no longer a nation to call for him to come back. And then guess what? Jesus can't come back because he can't lie. And he says, unless the nation calls him back, he will not come back. So what have you seen over the last 2,000 years? You've seen an intense persecution of the Jews that can only, the only answer given for that of why that is happening is it is strictly demonic. After the Holocaust, you would think that the world itself would look at the horrors the Jews went through for that. And be able to utter with them when they say never again. But yet, what do we see today? 
we see anti-Semitism the highest it's been in 40 years. Why? It's demonic, that's why. It's demonic. If you have this hatred or dislike for the Jews, I just want you to let you know where that's coming from. It's coming from Satan, not from God. That's coming from Satan. It's the reason why the, the world itself is able to, you know, look at just what happened a few weeks ago when Hamas attacks Israel. And then who gets the blame for it? Israel does. You know, it's Israel does. Because, you know, well, they don't allow them the freedom there in Israel for the Palestinians to do what they want to do. You know what's interesting about that statement? Is that there is not one freedom that the Palestinian people do not have in Israel. They can go to anywhere in Israel they want and they are fine. But you know what? The Jews cannot go anywhere they want in their own country. They cannot go to the West Bank. It's illegal for them to go to the West Bank. But the Arabs and, and, and the Palestinians, they, they can go anywhere they want there. And so you see it on the media. Who's to blame of what's going on there? Well, Israel, they're disproportionate. They're able to knock the missiles down. So when they, when they defend themselves, they do way more damage to them than what's being done to them, and that's not fair. What do you mean that's not fair? What you're telling me is that evil is good and good is evil. That the right of someone to defend themselves and cause more harm on the person that attacks them for some reason, that's wrong. But it's not wrong to attack. So ridiculous. So ridiculous. Well, Israel is much stronger. Okay, knucklehead, then don't attack them. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the little kid totally flicking the ears of a big kid. And the big kid finally turns around and goes, boom. And all of a sudden goes, hey, that's not fair. Really? Stop flicking his ears. <laughs> because that's really all you're doing to Israel. You're flicking their ears. But it's kind of like, okay, well, stop that. It's really, you know, childhood 101. You're a little kid. He's a big kid. You probably should leave him alone. And that's exactly what happens. But in the latter days, they will call evil good and good evil. And so why did the Holocaust happen? Because I would submit to you that that's probably who Satan thought was going to be his Antichrist. That's why at the time. And we're going to try and destroy the Jews. And we're still doing that. And it's always their fault. It's always that fault. The whole world knows who the Jews are. But nobody ever blames the Peruvians. Nobody ever blames, and you can think of a, a smaller group of people. Nobody, and yet this small little nation, everybody knows what's going on there. Has everybody's attention. Why? Because it's the apple of God's eye. That's why. And he tells it that all eyes are going to be on Israel in the latter days. And that wasn't the case in the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, the 19th century. And then it began in the 20th century when they became a nation again in 1948. And now all attention has always been on them. And everyone around the world knows who Israel is. And so what does Satan try and do? He's trying to destroy them. So they not call back. It's interesting because Israel, uh, I should say, the Jews under Abraham had their start about the same time as Chinese and Oriental culture did. And yet there's 1.4 billion Chinese in the world. How many Jews are in the world? 15 million. They should have just as many. They don't. Why? Because of all the persecution throughout history. That's why. Because of that. It's demonic. The oldest Jewish interpretation found in the third century BC are the Palestinian Targums, which is the um, Aramaic translation of the Bible. Third century BC. They see here in Genesis 3.15 that the serpent is symbolic of Satan and they look for victory over him in the days of the King Messiah from the seed of the woman. So even as far back as three um, in the third century BC, their understanding of Genesis 3.15 has always been the Messiah coming to defeat Satan. Now, going on to verse 16 here, he judges the woman and says, to the woman, he said, 
I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, means there will be a multiplication of your menstrual pain, is what that means there. Now, you didn't have that before the fall, now you have that after the fall. But this is what I did not see before, is the second part. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Well, how many times a year can you conceive? Has to do with your monthly cycle, right? So what that tells me is that the monthly cycle was not there before the fall. It wasn't monthly. Don't know how many cycles you had during the year, you know, before the fall. But it wasn't monthly before. He has increased your opportunity for conception. It means it was less in the fall. So, so what was that cycle? Quarterly? Was it twice a year? Was it once a year? Interesting. Think about that for a moment. Because if that's the case, then it brings a, a different understanding that I gave you know, a few weeks ago um, when, I mean, how long did it take before they fell in the garden? You have young hormonal man, young hormonal woman, naked. Come on, you're going to conceive in that first month. All right? I mean, it's just going to happen. But if your cycle isn't monthly, it's every six months, quarterly, every six months, once a year. Now, is it possible that they could have been obedient to God in the garden for two months, three months? Could it be six months that they were doing exactly what God has said for them to do in the garden? But now, just like anything, over time, you take things for granted and what was great and wonderful and exciting before isn't so much because familiarity breeds what? Contempt, you kind of let your guard down. We've always asked the question, wasn't it kind of strange for Eve to be speaking to a serpent? Did that happen every day? And was this the, well, maybe it wasn't the first time. Is it possible that the serpent has been coming in and out of the garden, been around the garden, been talking to her. Adam was there, and he, at the first time it happened, he was going, hey, what's this all about? But the serpent didn't say anything unbecoming or anything like that. And over time, a little bit of a friendship is there. And so now when the serpent shows up and Adam's there, it's no big deal. We, this has been going on for a couple months. That, that raises that possibility now. So all sorts of things. So when we look at it, at, they must have fallen right away because again, no. Right there it says that I will greatly multiply your conception, which means you weren't able to conceive like you're able to conceive now. You could do it at a greater capacity. There's a multiplication of conception. And so instead of a monthly cycle, maybe quarterly, maybe yearly, before the fall, a woman was not able to conceive as frequently because the earth would naturally be filled at a slower rate, a slower pattern, since mankind was not dying because there is no sin. After the fall, death is now part of the human experience, and therefore, to in order to fill the earth, it becomes necessary to increase a woman's ability to conceive. I, this is the first, I, you know, never even thought about that before, never saw that before, you know. I've been teaching the Word of God for 31 years. You never stop learning. There are certain things that come out and you just go, how is it that I have not seen that before? But you always learn. You're there, you never stop learning. And it goes on and says, in pain you shall bring forth childbirth. Birth is now involved in pain. So, but Jesus... He says this in John 16, 21. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. This is one of the most amazing things in life, okay? 
that if you have the, um, the pleasure and the ability to be in there when, when your wife is giving birth and to see all the anguish and the torment and the screaming, oh, the humanity, the screaming, and then the baby comes forth and then all of a sudden she looks at the child in the face and she totally forgets what she just went through. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> I am scarred for life. Every child, as I walk in, I go, oh my gosh, I know what's coming. You know, scarred for life. But my wife just weeks later is able to talk about, when do you think we have the next one? Have you forgotten? <laughs> she has, in the sense of, but look at this. How awesome is birth? It's amazing. It's God. We also read in 1 Timothy 2.15. It says that a woman, she will be saved in childbearing. And we, many people have always asked the question, what does that mean? In 1 Timothy 2.13, it says this. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness with self-control. This doesn't speak of spiritual salvation. This is how a woman is saved by giving birth, because then that is being saved by works. But what a, what a lot of translations don't have, even in the New King James, but it's in the Greek, is that there is a Greek definite article before the word childbearing. Young's, uh, Young's literal translation has it right when it reads, she will be saved through the childbearing. And that's why it's written in the Texas Receptus as well. There's a definite article, the genitive singular feminine. So the definite article, the childbearing, means it's speaking of a specific childbearing that saves them. And I would submit to you that is the, uh, the birth of Christ. And here, we're able to see this valuable role that we see in Genesis 3.15, that guess what? Even through the judgment, you're going to have the honor and the value of giving birth to the one who is going to redeem mankind. I think that's absolutely awesome. And so, again, the, the woman is given that valuable role that Satan hates. And even though the woman was deceived by Satan, she's going to give birth to the Christ child that will bring about his destruction. And then going back here to Genesis 3, it continues and it says about the woman, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. The Hebrew word for desire is used only one other time in Genesis. And it's in Genesis 4, 7, where sin desired to rule over Cain, who should have mastered, should have been the ruler over his sin. Instead, the sin ruled over him. And just like that, we have here, the woman will desire to have rule over her master, her husband. The point is a desire to possess. Eve will be placed under Adam's authority. She will desire to supersede that authority. She already has chosen to act independently of Adam, and now she will have a further desire to rule and possess him, a desire to control the man, to dispute the headship of the husband. And as we left off last week, and as we went over, um, is that uh, there is a federal headship in place. From the very beginning, God made the male and female and has given specific roles to the husband and to the wife. And so we went over that in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25 for when it comes to the marriage. Um, but today we're going to go over uh, male leadership in the church. Remember this federal headship, Adam, over all of humanity, and we talked about that last week. And what that represents is that Adam represents the family. Adam was federal head over all of humanity. Because Adam sinned, that then got imputed to the rest of humanity. In Romans 5, 12, we saw that. It says, therefore, just as through one man, that'd be Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So we're all born under the federal headship of Adam in this fallen state called sin. Now, Jesus has come and set up another federal headship under him. 
and he gains that federal headship but for, by dying for the sin of mankind. Now, any who receive the work that he did for them on the cross, guess what? We become a child of God and we transfer our federal headship from Adam under Christ. So today, everybody that's born under that federal headship of Adam in sin can choose. Do you want to remain under that federal headship of sin that leads to death? Or do you want to change that federal headship by receiving what Jesus did for you on the cross? If you do that, your federal headship is no longer Adam. It's Christ. And that's why we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. And I am no longer under the federal headship of Adam. I'm under the federal headship of Christ. Now, from the very beginning, God is into distinctions. He's into separating and making things distinct. They're not all the same. We see this from the very beginning. We see God divide the light from darkness. In Genesis 1 verse 2, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. The spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. The very first act of creation was to separate, to make distinctions, light from darkness. And yet they're both good. Light is good and darkness is good. But they are distinct, they are separate, they are different. God then divides the waters from under the atmosphere, from the waters above the atmosphere, Later, God separates the seas from dry land. God then creates a world of vegetation. And according to the distinctions of God, each plant is not the same, but will multiply according to its kind. So the vegetation is distinct and will only multiply according to its kind. And then we see with creation that God is about variety, distinction, God gave everything a very unique purpose, a diverse role, and a reason for being. One is not better than the other. It is just what it is. As a matter of fact, God himself is an example of this. Triune, yet harmonious. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. One triune nature. Each member of the Godhead has a specific role. The Father sits on his throne in heaven, sovereign over creation. The Son comes to earth to redeem and to save. Holy Spirit takes over where Jesus leaves off, pointing people to Jesus. The Son takes up residency in the believer's heart to conform them to the image of God. All three members of the Godhead are equal in essence and importance, yet they are separate and distinct in the role they have. One can say that about the genders as well. God made them male and female, and guess what? Male and female, equal in essence and importance, yet separate and distinct in the role and the uniqueness of how God wants to use us. We see in Scripture that the Son submits to the Father. The Holy Spirit points people to the Son. And this does not mean the Son is less than the Father or the Spirit is less than the Son. Again, all three members of the Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in nation, nature, distinct in their roles. And yet, we don't see any of them arguing with one another. We don't see one being jealous over the role of the other. You don't see one saying, hey, how come I'm not getting all the press clippings? Hey, how come God isn't pointing people to me, the Holy Spirit? Why do I have to point people to Jesus all the time? You don't see Jesus going, why can't I be the top person and be there on the throne and I get to be sovereign over everything and then I send the Father. You don't see any of this bickering going on. Yet they're all equal, but they're distinct and they have different roles. No one's complaining here. Instead, they're diverse and they're harmonious at the same time. And so here we have in chapters one and two of Genesis, God reaches the pinnacle of his creation, his creation of man. But God works comes with a very distinct significant, a very significant distinction, I should say. In Genesis 1.27, we read, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male 
and female. Only two genders. God created them, male and female. And so he did this from the very beginning because God is into distinction and separation and order comes from that and roles are assigned to gender. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Head speaks of leadership is what that speaks of. It's not the foot that leads you places, okay? It's your head that leads you. You determine, you think, you decide through your head. It's your head that leads. And so this is speaking of marriage, as well as I believe it's speaking of leadership in the church. But like I said, we've gone over marriage before. Genesis 2, 18 through 25, get that on the website um, and to go over that if you missed that. So we're gonna pick up why men are to lead in church at this point. Now I wanna make this clear, just because men are created and called to lead does not mean they're more valuable or more important or superior. It just means that's the order of things that God has put in place. That's all that means. I want you to go to Titus chapter one. You got first, second Timothy, then you have Titus. It's right before Philemon in the book of Hebrews. Look what it says here, starting in verse five. We read, for this reason, I left you in Crete. This is Paul speaking to Titus, Okay. This is why I left you in Crete, that you should set in order. There's an order to this. Set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by, uh, may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict uh, those who contradict. The word elders here in verse five, this is what you're going to do, Titus. I'm, set, I'm leaving you there because you need to set an order because things are in disorder right now. You're going to go to all the different churches and you're going to appoint elders. The word elder there is presbyteros. It means a term, it's a term of rank or office, someone of age, meaning mature, older, wiser. Here Paul is telling Titus, I want you to set an order, appoint elders in every city, meaning the churches in every city. And they are to be who? Elders who are what? Men. Right there, verse six, if a man is blameless, a husband of one wife, he goes on and says, verse seven, for a bishop must be blameless. Bishop and elder are interchangeable, okay? Same thing, the word bishop here is episcope. We'll get to that here in a moment. So bishop must be blameless. And so it goes on and says, and he holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able in verse nine. So we're able to see in one, two, three, four different places here in these five verses where it talks about him being a man, husband of one wife, which really means a one woman man is what that means. And so what is made very clearly here is that those that are to be set in positions of authority in the church are to be men. Go over here to 1 Timothy verse three. Chapter three, I should say. 1 Timothy chapter 3. It begins with, this is a faithful saying. 1 Timothy chapter 3. If a man desires the position of a bishop, it couldn't be more clear. If a man, not woman, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Twice in that verse, it makes it very clear who should be a bishop, who should be an elder. A man should be. The word bishop, episcope, actually two words are used here. Epe, which means over or on top, and scope, which means to see, or where we get our English word scope, to scope out, okay? To be on top, to be able to see is what that means. 
And so this is what a bishop is. This is what a pastor is. This is what an elder is. This is what a shepherd is. And they're all interchangeable there. But they're to be men so they can oversee, kind of like from the top of things that are going on. And the person who does that, who is to lead in that way, is to be a man, is to be a man. Now, I do. I oversee everything that goes on in this church. And when we take on a new ministry, I'll always say, yeah, we will do that. If there is something that needs to be done, whether there's someone hurting the fellowship to come alongside, yeah, we will come alongside of that. And when I say we, 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 I usually mean Joey, okay? <laughs> but my point is, he's also a pastor. John is a pastor. Frank is a pastor. Chris Garrett is a pastor. Chris Kroger is a pastor. Larry is a pastor. And then I have all these community group leaders. They're under shepherds. And we have all these people in, in our leadership. They're also under shepherds. And they are seeing specific ministries. And they wrote, report back to either Joey or John or some of these other pastors who then report to me. And they tell me all the things that are going on in this fellowship. And how God is blessing and how this ministry, maybe it's time to put an end to it. It's not so fruitful, but now we got this other ministry and they bring it to me. And so I'm here looking at it all saying, okay, from everything that's being reported back to me, this is what's happening in this fellowship. And I get to oversee all of that. I get to oversee all of that. And it's supposed to be a man who does that. It's supposed to be a man. Look what it says here. It says here in verse two, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable. Look at this, able to teach. Men teach. Men teach. And we'll get into why a woman doesn't here in a second. Although women do, but it's with other women. And we'll show that here in a moment not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentile, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Look what it says. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, thus being puffed up with pride. He fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So Someone's been a believer for two years, three years, four years. No, you shouldn't be leading a church at that point, okay? There's so much more for you to learn. And if you do, it's going to go to your head and you're going to fall because of pride. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Look how time says he, he, his, his, this man, you know, uh, if a man desires, I mean, it makes it so clear. It's supposed to be a man. Bob Borkovec um, also texted me last night and said, he said, by the way, not only are the pronouns in, in the masculine in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, but all the adjectives describing the leader are masculine singular to further the point men are to lead in the church. It's, makes it very, very clear. We're given different titles. It could be pastor, it could be elder, it could be shepherd, okay? But what another title that needs to be a must is that title mister. It's to be a man, always, always. Now I want you to go over here and I want to see, it's this background and this understanding that we have here in verses, uh, in chapter 2, verse 11 here in 1 Timothy, okay? When we read this, let a woman learn in silence with all submission and do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Why? Because Adam was formed first, then Eve. So, so it has nothing to do with culture, has everything to do with in the beginning and the created order of things. And here's another reason. Adam was not the one deceived, but the one being deceived fell into transgression. So we're given the reasons there. They're not cultural whatsoever. 
Let a woman learn in silence with all submission means she is to listen to the word of God given by that male teacher, overseer, pastor. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Why? Because that's not the created order of things. That's why. The woman is not to be the head. The man is to be the head. But to be in silence so as to receive the teaching that is given here. Now, women can teach. They're to teach other women, we're told in Timothy and Titus. Okay? The older women are to teach who? The younger women. Can I tell you something, ladies? There's always a younger woman than you. That's why we have discipleship. So you can use your gifting in that area of teaching other women. Okay? You can teach in women's Bible study. You can teach other women in the way of discipleship. You can teach in the way of a Sunday school teacher all the way up into sixth grade. But after that, guess who teach? Men. Why? Well, because we know that, according to God's word, a man is a man at the age of what? Twelve. The age of twelve. It's one of the reasons why, yeah, you can go to our Sunday school and you'll see many women teaching and, and things like that. But when you get to junior high, guess what you don't see? You don't see women teach. And you don't see it in high school ministry. And as, as far as I am alive, you will never see it here in this pulpit to this congregation. Because that's the order that God has put in place. You can teach before the age of 12 because they're not a man. They're still a boy. And women can teach boys and girls, okay? But once they become a man, and that happens around pu puberty and around 12, and at that point, junior high, we have men lead. That's the reason for that. That's the reason for that. I've had many discussion with many pastors who said, so you're telling me you can have this amazing qualified woman, and she wants to lead the high school ministry, the junior high ministry, but you're going to say no to that and let this other guy lead even though he's not as anointed as she is. And I said, well, we, we're going to disagree on what anointed is, for one. But for two, I'd be going, yes, we are going to allow for him to lead. And even though she might be a better teacher of the word and everything else, we're going to let him grow into that position. But we're going to honor what God's word says above efficiency of what we think it might be a better way of doing things. I don't think there's ever a better way of doing things except God's way. And so that's what we do here. And this is why men lead here, is because this is what God's word says. It's interesting to me, because here's the thing. When women exercise authority over a man, I'm just here to tell you something. More often than not, men will let you. It's frustrating to me, but it's absolutely true because men willingly take a back seat. We saw this last week in, in chapter uh, three here in Genesis that as Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, Adam was right there. She eats the fruit and he's kind of like going, what did it taste like? <laughs> Dude, you don't stop her. You don't tell her, hey, we're not supposed to do that. Nah, 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 don't eat of that. There's no leadership. She's leading the charge. She's talking to the servant. Servant says, eat of the fruit. She goes in and takes of the fruit, puts it in her mouth. She's leading that whole thing. And you're just sitting there on the sidelines there. Sandy Adams had this to say. Sandy came and, and taught on male leadership at our CCA conference back in 2018. So I went back and I watched that and there's so many good things that I gleaned from that I was able to share here with you as well. And, um, but he said this so well that I want to read this verbatim of, of what he said that I think will really minister. He said, Paul's directives for ladies being silent in the church is not to repress women, but to embolden men to step up and lead in the church and at home. Women are more verbal than men, more nurturing, more apt to instruct, more perceptive. This is why it's so easy for women to take the reins of leadership. Real quick, more perceptive. I love that. 
When it came to unleashing the discipleship program here at this church like five years ago, whenever that was, um, we were going to take, I was going to take the men's leadership through it, and then Mindy was going to take the women's leadership through it. And I said, okay, we're starting this week. You can go ahead and start this week too. And she goes, no, no, no. I'm going to wait till you guys go through it. I said, why? And she goes, because men are supposed to lead. I said, oh, you are a wise woman. <laughs> that is so true. So the ladies didn't go through the women's discipleship with the women's leadership until after the men did. That's perceptive. That's wise. Because we lead. Because we lead. Women are more prone to be teachers than men, he says. Ladies, listen to me here. This is what you do not realize. Ladies, you have to show restraint if you want your man to lead. Look, ladies, if you're always asserting yourselves, doing all the talking, taking over, your husband will get to the place where he'll hand over the reins of leadership. Because, ladies, men have been taught at a very early age, you do not fight women. You just don't. And he will let you lead and then watch as he disengages with you. And he finds other things to do, whether it's recreation or whatever it might be, buddy's night out, lets you handle everything. The man is not going to fight you for leadership. Thus, as a woman, you are determined to lead. The man is going to let you. And by the way, I've seen that time and time again here in this church. When it gets down to it, well, he's not leading. Well, she won't let me lead. Well, give me an example. And he said, well, I tried it. And then she kept fighting me. On, and so I said, fine, forget it. And I said, well, you're a wimp. <laughs> and you shouldn't just say, fine, forget it. You know? He goes on and says, this is why for men to step up in church, women need to voluntarily take a step back. It's not a competition. God has given us roles to be complement one another. If women teach and preach and have authority over a man, then men will not step up, take their God-appointed initiative to lead in the church or their marriage. Women are to be submission, be in submission. And that word means just like it says, submission. Ladies, you're under the mission that God has ordained for the gender roles to preach. Show me a good husband who loves his wife and leads his children faithfully. I will show you a very smart woman who has learned to step back in ways that allow him to step up and be the leader God has called him to be. Show me a church with strong male leadership. And I won't just show you determined men. I will show you strong women who are most likely more talented than those men but wisely and deliberately took the back seat so the men would be inclined to grab the wheel and steer. Show me a church where the men are missing in action, absent in their duties to lead. I'll show you a church with unwise women who have competed for the leadership and females leading in the church, females leading in the marriage is not the way to get men to lead. That just encourages men to be lazy and women, you play a part in this if you're leading in the church or in your marriage. I think that hits it right on the head. So, Dave, what about Galatians 3.28? Go to Galatians 3.28. Go ahead, bring it. In Galatians 3.28, first you have to understand, I want you to go back here to Galatians chapter 3, just verse 1. I just want you to see what we're dealing with here. The whole theme of the book of Galatians is that the just will live by faith. It, has, it speaks of salvation through faith alone. And this Jewish legalism that is coming into the church to say, no, you need to also do this, this, and this. This is what Paul is fighting here. And so he says here in verse one, and I use this for anybody that wants to use verse 28 as a reason why there can be female pastors. I'm just going to say what Paul says. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth 
before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed, among you as crucified. The o- this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, you're now being made perfect in the flesh? How foolish are you? Salvation is by faith. And when you put your faith in Jesus, it's Jesus who justifies and makes you an heir to the seed of Abraham. Jesus is what does that. So in the background of all this in verse 28, understand what's going on. Paul is going to bring up You aren't justified by the law. The law is there. It brings a curse. It tells you all the things that is wrong with you. That's what the law is there to do. And yet Abraham was justified before the law, which tells us you can be justified in believing in God because the law wasn't there to justify you. And so what is the purpose of the law? It is there to show transgression that you're in sin in need of a savior. But Jewish law kept foreigners, slaves, and women from having an inheritance. The inheritance only went to the man. But when it comes to salvation, it's different. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or a foreigner or uh, or a female. All can be saved and all can have an inheritance. That's why it says in verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Guess what? Women, as you receive Jesus, you're considered a son of God in what context? As as we further read, as we further read. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Greek means those who are of the Greek culture, and that would be anybody who isn't a Jew, so that'd be Gentile, okay? So whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, Jew or a secular person in Greek culture, there's neither slave nor free when it comes to salvation. You don't have to be free in order to be a partake in salvation. If you're a slave, you can also still be saved. There's neither male or female. Doesn't mean if you're male or female, you can be saved. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise of who? Abraham. You're now an heir. You're now a seed of Abraham. You're all sons of God because it's the sons that are the heirs to their fathers. But not so in Christ. In Christ, you're all sons of God in the sense that you all have an inheritance coming. That is what is being spoken here in Galatians chapter 3. That is what the, the book of Galatians is all about, is that you're not justified by the law, you're justified by faith, and your salvation is in Christ alone. That is what's being discussed there. What is not being discussed in Galatians anywhere are the roles of a man or a woman or the roles of men in the way of leadership in the church. That's not being spoken of anywhere in the book of Galatians. And to use that to be the reason why it's okay to have female pastors, may the Lord rebuke you because you're adding and taking away and putting your own spin on what the word of God says. And you're not allowing the word of God to truly speak what it's being said here. You're doing eisegesis, not exegesis. You're pouring your own thoughts into it instead of letting it speak to you. There is nowhere in there that speaks about the roles of a man or woman. There's nowhere in there that speaks of leadership. And isn't it interesting that the letter itself was written back in like AD early 50s. And then 10 to 15 years later is when Titus and Timothy were written. Why did Paul write those if men and women are the same and there's no distinct roles and anybody could be in leadership. Why did he write what he wrote in Titus as we went over and also in 1 Timothy chapter 3? Did he just forget what he wrote to Galatia? Did he just forget that, hey, there's no male or female 
and he just forgot when he was telling you this is what qualifies for a bishop, an overseer, or a pastor, that he be a man? Did he forget about this? I would say you're a fool to equate what is being said here in Galatians to leadership in the church. You're a fool, and may the Lord rebuke you. May the Lord rebuke you. I'm going to wrap this up by saying this. This is the biggest reason men are to lead at home and in the church. Now, you might want to write this down because if you can receive what I'm about to say, your faith in God will increase, your understanding of God will increase, your fruitfulness in Christ will skyrocket. You arguing with the word of God will completely go away. Are you ready for this? Drum roll. Here's the biggest reason men are to lead at home and in the church is because God said so. <laughs> Do you think you can remember that? If you could just remember that in anything you read in God's word, Dave, why are you doing this? Well, because God said so. Okay, but why? I, I don't really need to give you a why beyond that. God is who he is, and I have a higher view of scripture than you if you want to argue with what God's word says. I am not going to argue with what God's word says. It says that I'm going to believe it. If you don't, that's fine. But just so you understand, I have a much higher view of God and his word than you do. And I don't ever want to face God with having a low view of him and his word. I just don't. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we are definitely blessed to have your word. I mean, this is what your word says. That's why we just need to do it. Be a doer of your word. And, and so as we go through the creation account, there's reasons for why you have said what you've said. There's reasons why you have the created order. There's reasons why you set in order certain things. And so we need to believe that. And we need to do it whether we like it or not. It's it's not, it has nothing to do with personal taste. It has nothing to do with how we feel about something. It has everything to do with laying ourselves down, picking up the cross and following you. And we do that when we read some area of scripture that kind of rankles us that we don't like and our flesh kind of struggles with. Okay, but it's pretty clear what God's word says it is. Then we just need to do that. And as we do that, the flesh dies. So I do pray that we would be men and women that have a high view of your word and be willing to do what your word says above and beyond what culture tells us. Because honestly, that's the only way the world is gonna see that we're different is by doing what your word says, not by what feels comfortable. Father, I pray that you would make us men and women of your word and we would take this leadership seriously in our own personal relationships and here at the church and, and that you would continue to raise people up uh, to be able to use those giftings here in this fellowship. And, and Lord, we will do what your word says. Men will lead. And, uh, and so um, women have a very valuable place in the body and that is to minister to other women and to uh, be able to minister uh, to children and so, and that's a valuable, valuable place in the church. We love them. We love you. And we pray that you be glorified, that we're here to make your name great. I pray that is accomplished here today, that we would always remember when we leave here, that's when we enter the mission field and that we could be a light and a witness of what you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to stand and we'll do one last song. <clears throat>
body and we have pastors and leaders up here if anybody needs prayer. Hey, we want to thank you for joining us online. We're excited that you found us here at Calvary Castle Rock. The scriptures tell us in Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so if you have done that, if you uh, have made the decision, you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, that you have confessed with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, we want to say congratulations. This is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. Um, we would also love to hear from you uh, if you've made this decision and answer any questions that you might have about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Um, how do I find uh, a church that believes and teaches the Bible? Um, the importance of discipleship now that you've made this decision. We would also love to um, send you your first Bible as a free gift from us uh, at Calvary Castle Rock to celebrate your decision to follow the Lord Jesus. So all you have to do is go to calvarycastlerock.com, click on the link Know God, and then fill out the form so we can get a little bit of information from you so that we can send you your free gift. Um, again, congratulations. We would love to hear your story. We would love to connect with you, and we would love to pray with you. Uh, Lord bless. Songs of